last night at about uh, 12.45, the, the unthinkable happened. I went to save my message, which wasn't done yet. Uh, if, if those of you know, I was preached a sermon this week for a wedding, and then we had the children's fair all day yesterday. And I went to save it, and the computer froze, and I thought I'd lost everything. But thankfully, when I rebooted there, it was. And so that was really nice. <laughs> uh, today is How to Win the Cosmic Lottery, Part 2. And I just want to say thank you, church, for all the uh, wonderful workers that came out yesterday. It was great to have you all there. It was great to have everybody uh, so cheerful, so uh, joyful, uh, serving and being a blessing to the kids. And I think we all had a we all had a great time. So here we are at church. Have you ever noticed that being at church is kind of a religious thing to do? You know, a lot of Christians, myself, are not comfortable with the word, and this drives. Uh, non-religious people crazy because it's Dan it's obvious that you're religious and I'm thinking boy I don't even like that word and I don't think of myself as a religious person if I you've heard me say that if I didn't believe God were real if I didn't believe Jesus were real I'd rather be home either in bed or watching the pregame for football or or actually doing things I don't like to do. <laughs> I'd rather do anything than sit in church if I didn't believe it was true. I don't feel very religious. I don't, I'm not even that big into uh, rituals and ceremonies. I, I want to bless people, and I understand it's part of my job as a pastor, so I, I want to do that to the best of my ability, but that's not my thing either. Uh, so I don't think of myself as particularly religious. I, I pretty much have always thought with... Uh, a logical way of thinking, so I don't think of myself as like hocus pocus and magic uh, kind of mentality. Uh, so a lot of Christians, including myself, like to say we don't follow religion, we follow a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I say that sometimes myself. Problem is the Bible calls Christianity religion. Uh, I'm not entirely comfortable at all when people call me religious. There's so many negative connotations with the word. But I trust God and believe that he does love us. I believe that Jesus died to save us. I believe that he rose from the dead and offers forgiveness and eternal life to all who will trust him enough to follow him. So I guess that makes me religious. And as I said, anyway, the Bible in the New Testament twice in 1 Timothy and then once in James refers to Christianity as a religion, so there is that. When I say the word religion, though, it can conjure up uh, vastly different emotions based upon your personal history with the word, the experiences you attach to it. There can be good experiences or there can be bad ones. Sometimes the experiences aren't even our own. It's just kind of a cultural narrative that we buy into. It's like groupthink. Have you ever heard of that, groupthink? All society's going this way. Everybody likes this band, so we all like this band. All my friends like this re restaurant, but now they don't. They all like this re restaurant, so now I like the new restaurant. Uh, if we live around a lot of people who feel very positively about faith, then odds are uh, that even if we don't go to our church ourselves, we're going to have this positive image of religion. It's kind of like we just inherit this attitude from other people. So if all your friends and family go to church and you don't, you might feel like deep down inside, yeah, it's a good thing. You might have this, see, you might have this positive idea of faith. On the other hand, if the people you hang around with are always bad-mouthing organized religion and church and those hypocritical Christians or whatnot, maybe you've never even had a bad experience with Christians. Uh, maybe all the media you consume, whether it's on the internet or, or, or the music you listen to or the television shows you watch, are always making a joke out of Christianity. And it's this really heavy amount of negativity towards religion. Then you might have also a negative feeling towards religion, even if you didn't have a personally bad experience with it. Even if, yeah, church is pretty good. I went as a kid. Sunday school was okay. 
Still, you might develop a negative attitude towards religion just because this huge cultural narrative that we've bought into that's uh, anti-religion. Religion means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. When some people hear the word religion, they think of people who are naive, childish, superstitious, gullible, the, the masses, the uneducated, clinging to old ways in a modern world. For other people, the word religion resonates in their heart like the word family and home. For some, religion equals tradition, wholesomeness, the good old days when we think things were simpler. Some people equate being religious with being patriotic or even American. Yeah, sure, I'm a Christian. I'm an American. For others, religion sounds like the word oppression. Have you noticed that? Some people hear the word religion, it sounds oppressive to them. If you say, I'm religious, it comes off like saying, I'm judgmental, I'm self-righteous. To say you are religious seems like you're saying, I hate people who are different than me. Bear fans. No. <laughs> I'm getting through to somebody. So religion is one of those words with a lot of baggage. And that's why I don't like to use it. But I want to run another option past you, a kind of a what-if scenario. What if religion was more than traditional values? What if religion was about, wasn't about using my faith to build myself up so that I could look down on other people? What if true religion wasn't made by human beings at all? What if it didn't just go this direction, what if it came originally from this direction, heavenwards down? What if true religion is God or, uh, originated, God reaching down to us? What if God really did love us and was trying to get our attention? If all of this was God trying to get our attention? What if Jesus really did die to pay for our sins and to save us from eternity, separated from God, which is the definition of hell? What if it's true that God loves you? Guys? What if it's true that God loves you? How would you respond? What if God gave us this book, this Bible, because He loves us? See, without a Bible, people say, well, I, 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 don't, I, have, I believe in God, but I, I just kind of do it on my own. But then you know what you're stuck with? You're stuck with not knowing anything. It, it, like if I told you one day, I've got another sister and her name's Bertha, you've never met her before, and you guys say, oh, I know all about Bertha. And I say, how do you know about Bertha? Unless she comes here, shows herself to us, writes a letter, posts on Facebook or something, you can't know, I, instantly I don't have a sister named Bertha, but, but you couldn't know about her unless she showed herself to us. And in the same way, if God doesn't love us, don't expect a Bible. But if at the heart of God is love, love wants to reveal itself. That's why a lover, a boyfriend, girlfriend dating, they want to know each other and they want to be known. You want people you care about to understand where you're coming from, right? If God loves us, we should expect a Bible. We should expect that he would open up his heart for us. So we have all these questions like, I feel guilty, but there's, is there forgiveness? Is there any way for me to be forgiven? I don't know. I'm just overwhelmed with this. Or, I'm afraid. What happens when I die? And God says, I don't care what you think because I don't love you. <laughs> or, God says, no, there is a way to be forgiven and I want you to know. And I want you to know you can be with me in heaven. You can have eternal life. See, God loves us enough to show us his heart. What if that's true, that this book wasn't just a bunch of people over many centuries, all writing a cohesive book by some chance? Or what if this book is from the heart of God? How would that change your life? How would you respond? Would that make you happy to know that God loves you? I mean, if God doesn't love you, I want to say hello to a bunch of amoebas. Seriously. The universe doesn't care when amoeba gets flushed down the toilet. The uh, universe is not really there to weep about squirrel killed on the side of the road. You may, but you're going to be worm food in a few years anyways. Serious. 
We are all just sucking air, eating food, going to the wash washroom, and we only have a few decades to do this, and they go fast. And then it's over. And who's going to mourn you? One generation, two generations? Well, I still mourn my great-grandpa and great-grandma, but I don't know my great-great-grandpa and great-great-grandma. In fact, most of the Wolf family is lost to me. I don't know. And what about when Western culture inevitably goes down or human culture goes down? What about when the last person sucks their little portion of air? Well, we've got the moon. Moon doesn't know. The moon doesn't have any consciousness. We've got the sun. The sun's, sun's not aware of us. Our planet just moves around like this little speck in outer space. There could be a supernova go off and, we're, and it's all gone and the universe has no record of us. If there's no God who loves us, I'm sorry, your life is pathetic, worthless, meaningless. Any small modicum of joy you, you create out of it now is gone and it has no it doesn't reverberate in eternity it has no lasting value so i want to ask you a question again what if a god who made all the trillions of stars who is aware of every amoeba by the way the bible tells us he knows when every sparrow falls from the sky and dies what if such a god the bible tells us he's aware of how many hairs you have on your head the bible tells us that he has a name for all the trillions of stars what if such a god loves you so much that he saw you with all your bad things in your heart and in your mind he came and he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins he says i want to forgive you completely just trust me and come to me what if that god loves you would that change your life Would you want to love God in return? And how do we define religion in that context? Because that, that might be something I'd be interested in. We're going to read a passage today where Christ says some confusing things, some really challenging things. And as we read it, I want us to ask ourselves if Jesus really is God in flesh how should I respond to the words of Jesus? If it really is God coming down into human history, how should I respond to what he says? We looked at some of this last week. We had said, last week was how to win the cosmic lottery, part one. This is how to win the cosmic lottery, part two. Please turn to Luke chapter nine. Luke chapter nine, 24 through 27. All right, guys, let's pay attention. Luke 24, 25, 26, 27. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Here's the words of Jesus Christ, okay? This is Jesus talking. So let's just start with 23. Then Jesus said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. You know, that's a lot like saying, if you want to marry me, you have to say goodbye to all your other boyfriends you have to put up put on this ring and you have to do you have to go through life with me jesus is saying leave everything else behind uh, he's enough for us we're going to walk with jesus whoever wants to be my disciple jesus says must deny themselves that's part one deny yourself your selfishness take up your cross these hard things we bear, especially, you notice that some people will mock you, some people will laugh at you if you say you love Jesus now, now you've changed, now you're living for Jesus. You can catch some flack for that. You might even be embarrassed to admit it to your friends and family. Uh, Jesus said, Put up, carry that cross, carry it for me. Uh, if you love me, don't be embarrassed of me. So, so uh, deny yourself, take up your cross, and then follow me. And, and Jesus goes to some difficult places he goes to the worst hellhole on earth. He went to the cross, and he does all of this in order to show love. And Jesus says, I'm going to take you to some difficult places so that you can show love to other people. And uh, those are the things that Christ asks us to do. Then look at verse 24. And again, who is he? Is he God in the flesh? If he's God and he's saying, follow me, are you going to say, no, I think I'll do things my way? Or are you going to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to follow you? Did, did everybody hear that? That's a big question, right? How are you going to answer Christ? For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. 
If you're all about number one, I gotta protect myself, I gotta hold on to my stuff, I gotta I gotta make sure I'm okay, you're gonna have a miserable life. You're gonna have a miserable, worthless life, and it, it's gonna end in hell, eternal separation. Nobody wants to go to hell. And nobody has to go to hell. You can go to heaven by trusting in Jesus Christ. So uh Whoever wants uh, to hold on to their life and just look out for themselves, they're going to lose it. Uh, but whosoever loses their life for me, gives their life entirely to Christ, or even dies for his sake, that person will save it. And we saw that just this last week. According to the news, there was a couple witnesses who have come forward and said, out in Oregon, there was this, remember this nasty fellow out in Oregon? He was going by and he was asking people if they're uh, a Christian. The people who answered no or didn't answer, they got shot. But they got shot in the leg or something. He just was injuring them. But the person who said, yes, I'm a Christian, he shot them to kill them. And I saw somebody put on Facebook, the bravest person in the world is the second person he asked. Uh, are you a Christian? Yes. Boom. And then the next person, are you a Christian? That person said yes. Uh, but Christ says, if you lose your life for my sake, uh, you will have eternal life. And in, uh, in our context, very few people ever have a, a gun put up to their head. Uh, 20, 30,000, I don't even know the number of people die in car accidents every year. The amount of terrorism since 9-11 is a few hundred. The mountain mass shootings is, is much greater than terrorism, but still far less than, uh, than accidents of various sorts. Uh, so it's very unlikely that somebody's going to hold up a gun to your head. But will you be willing to give your life away for Jesus? Give your Sunday to Jesus. Give your love for Jesus. That we live our lives for Jesus and to help other people to know Jesus. If you give your life away, brothers and sisters, you haven't wasted your life. Any hour you've given to Jesus is not wasted. Any day you've given to Jesus is not wasted. When you show people love, even when they don't deserve it, and they walk away from you, don't think, well, I wasted all that effort. No. Listen, God sees your love. Nothing done in His name is ever wasted. Jesus says, if, you, if your life is used up for my sake, you will gain real life. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, there you go, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm not a Bible thumper. Do not be ashamed of this Bible. Do not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, Jesus says that he will be ashamed of us. Uh, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes into his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. Uh, if you're not willing to stand for Christ now, you won't get the chance later. Truly, I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before you see the kingdom of God. And there's a lot of things that might mean. Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, did the kingdom of God come at Pentecost? Did the kingdom of God come when Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Did the kingdom of God come when the early church was founded? There's a lot of different possibilities there. Or it could be uh, this generation. I'm not sure what Christ meant. Uh, but we can see that these confusing things that Jesus said, these are hard things, right? Jesus said very difficult things. Uh, we have to decide who he is. Because if he's just some other guy, I would recommend you not listen to Jesus. But if there's a God in heaven and God loved you and he came and he died for your sins, then we should follow him with everything we've got. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus with every fiber of your being. Follow Jesus with all your heart. Follow Jesus with all your mind. Follow Jesus with all your strength. And why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? He's given us eternity. He's given us forgiveness of sins. He's given us love. And you won't be an amoeba. Your life will count. You'll have meaning. Last week we saw Matthew Henry, a theologian and pastor born in 1662, said, It is well or ill with us according as it is well or ill with our souls. The body cannot be happy if the soul is miserable, but the soul may be happy, though the body is greatly afflicted and oppressed in this world. We must never be ashamed of Christ and his gospel. Amen. All right, let's look at uh, 9... Chapter 9, verse 28. This is a weird verse. This is a really, really weird verse. You ready? You're going to laugh when you hear this verse. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, James, and John with him and went up on a mountain to pray. Isn't that weird? That is just the most bizarre, 
one of those bizarre verses. Have you heard people say that there's contradictions in the Bible? Well, most of the time they can't point to one. Uh, but if they pointed to this one, they'd maybe be right. There is, this is the most unusual, unexpected differences in the synoptic Gospels. This is, you know, there's John, the Gospel of John that's a little different, but then Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they parallel a lot. So we call those the synoptic Gospels. Probably Mark was written first, and we spoke about this before. Probably Mark was written first because Matthew incorporates a lot of Mark, but he oddly changes some things. We also said it's possible that Matthew was written first and then Mark is an abbreviated version of it, like a tract version that you can hand out quickly. Uh, Mark is uh, often called by the early church, is, was known as the Memoirs of Peter, so even though Mark was not an apostle, it was probably dictated to him by Peter. So we have Matthew and Mark, these are the first two, and then Luke is the last of the three Gospels that parallel. Matthew and Mark both say six days later. And then Luke comes along, writing after Matthew and Mark are already in the hands of many of the churches. He says, yeah, you know, it was about eight days. He doesn't say it was eight days. It was exactly eight days. He says, it was, and why eight? Isn't that a weird number? It was about five days. It was about ten days. It was about eight days. Uh, that is a funny, funny thing. Uh, Luke Again, was not even an apostle. He was not uh, with them when that happened. Matthew was. Uh, Peter was. Luke is relying on eyewitnesses that he's interviewed, and he changes what the first two guys say. When they say six days, he says, oh, about eight days. Not five days, not seven days, or about a week. That would have been appropriate, right? About a week later. He writes about eight days. And you know what? I have no clue why I did that. The Bible Knowledge Commentary does point out that the two accounts are not contradictory. For one, he says about, right? And if one understands Mark as speaking of the intervening days in Luke and Matthew, uh, I mean, uh, of the intervening days, and Luke includes the days of Jesus' teaching as well as the day on which he arrives at the Day of Transfiguration, then you have Matthew and Mark be the six middle days, and here is the day of Jesus' teaching. That's one day over here, and here's the day he rises at the mountain. That's another day over here. That's eight. So I think that makes sense. Uh, I just think it's so funny that of all the things he could correct or change, he goes from six to eight and then says about. So maybe that just amused me way too much. Okay. All right. Let's keep reading. And uh, as we read, understand that Luke's record here is... Uh, Again, again, why are we studying this? So we can love Jesus more. Why did Luke write this? So that people could know who Jesus is. This whole book is helping us understand who Jesus is. Why, why should I deny myself? Shouldn't I just do whatever I want to do? Why should I take up my cross? i rather like to avoid trouble in my life. Why should I follow Jesus? He might ask me to love somebody that I'm angry with. He might ask me to forgive somebody I don't want to forgive. Why should I follow Jesus? Because those kinds of commands tend to mess up my plans. You notice that? When God asks you to do something, it doesn't always fit our convenient plans. God is not convenient. He's God. He don't care about being convenient for you or me. He says, this is what I want you to do, and it's our job to bow before him and say, yes, Lord. Those are big demands, and they change everything. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, God is the great interferer, because he will interfere with your plans and with your life. So I got to know why I should listen to Jesus. Let's look now at Luke chapter 9, from verse 28, and we're going to go all the way to verse 36. This part is called the transfiguration. It, the tr uh, transfiguration is kind of like a caterpillar when things have been transformed. We're going to see Jesus changed. We're going to see him transfigured before our eyes. Okay. About eight days after Jesus. Yep. Thank you, Luke. Uh, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, this is Christ, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became bright as a flash of lightning. Two men 
Moses and Elijah appeared to in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. A little sidetrack. Uh, sometimes people ask, will we know each other in heaven? I don't know if this verse answers that question. But if the apostles recognize this, this is Moses, this is Elijah. There must be something so compelling about us as individuals created in the image of God, as people that God has welcomed into his family as his children, that we recognize one another and that they would recognize, wow, that's Moses, even though he lived hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Elijah, even though he died hundreds of years ago. Moses and Elijah appeared also in glorious splendor and they were talking with Jesus. So in heaven, all we do is play harp? No. There's conversation between one another. They're talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure. This is an interesting word here. Uh, which he was about to bring uh, to fulfillment in Jerusalem. His departure. You know what they're talking about in Jerusalem? The cross, right? They're talking about the fact that Jesus is going to soon die on the cross. They call it his departure. More on that in a little bit. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, as I imagine, I imagine they would, they were very sleepy, but then they see Jesus as he really is, and guess what? They wake up. Have you ever, have you ever been kind of sleepy and then something uh, at church, but then something clicks and you kind of see God from a different angle or something wakes up inside of you and you find out that you're now no longer sleepy? Uh, they became fully awake. They saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter, because Peter is a big mouth, the Apostle Peter, this guy that we always respect so much, he's a blabbermouth. He says foolish things. He's always talking when he doesn't need to be talking. And Jesus says, as, as it's winding down and, and, and Moses and Elijah are about to leave, Peter says, Master, it's so good for us to be here. Let us put up three tabernacles or shelters or, or places to pray, places to worship, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And then Luke, who wasn't there, kind of puts this parenthetical statement. He didn't know what he was talking about. So Dr. Luke, writing at the same time, Peter is still alive and he feels free. And I wonder, he got, how did he know about the transfiguration? Maybe, very likely, since he was a friend of Peter. It was Peter who explained this to him. Peter probably said, oh man, I had no clue what I was doing. And so Luke's writing this, uh-huh, uh-huh. He did not know what he was talking about. He did not know what he was saying. He just puts this here right in the text. While he was still speaking, God decides to step on his words. While Peter was babbling, saying unimportant things, saying foolish things, saying things that did not need to be said, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they went from sleepy to wide awake to babbling to now they're terrified. They were afraid as they entered the cloud, and a voice came out of the cloud that they're surrounded by saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. You can stop talking now, Peter. You can listen to Jesus. And who is Jesus? Well, he's not like Moses. He's not Elijah. God says, this is the one I have chosen. Listen to him. Brothers and sisters, here we are this morning. I said, why are we at church? What are we doing here? Is this just some religion? Or is Jesus Christ the chosen one? Did God come down because he loves you? And then God himself from heaven is saying, listen to him. Listen to Jesus. He says, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. What does it profit you to gain the whole world if you lose your soul? All the things we fight for, we strive for, what if you get it and you miss Jesus? Listen to Jesus. It changes everything. We don't have to go to hell. We can be more than an amoeba. Our life can have purpose. We can know God himself and be a part of his family. Last time I taught this passage, I said, I didn't know why God chose Moses and Elijah. Uh, there's some theories out there. I still don't know why for sure. Could have been Adam and David, right? It's interesting to think that both Moses and Elijah discovered God's nature on a mountain. There's something to that. And now Peter, James, and John are discovering God in Jesus Christ, and they're on a mountain. And brothers and sisters, if we just paid attention, we discovered who Jesus was. 
He's not just some old guy who said a lot of things that bore us. He's a son of God. God himself says, listen, and we better pay attention. One thing I never noticed before as well, uh, verse 31, Moses and Elijah were speaking of Christ's departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Did you know the Greek word for departure is actually exodus? The same word that was used to describe the book of Exodus in Greek, in, in, uh, in the Septuagint. Doesn't that make you wonder if part of what they were talking about and we don't know, but it makes me wonder. Here's Moses, the, the author of Exodus, the one who led the chosen people, that led the children of Israel out of slavery into the promised land. How were they talking about Christ's death? Oh, it's going to be really painful. It's going to be horrible. You're going to be beaten. You're going to be spit on. They're using the word Exodus here. You're about to experience your Exodus in Jerusalem. You will soon exit this land of darkness. You will soon exit this land of suffering and return to the promised land. Just as Moses and the children uh, of Israel were led out of Egypt, and Christ now can lead us all out. He's the first one out. He's the first one to exit. He can lead us all out of this land of darkness and suffering. And all who follow Jesus will enter this land of light, will enter a land of... Uh, flowing with, with beauty, a vast multitude escaping slavery, leaving a living hell for a land of blessing overflowing with milk and honey. Isn't that kind of neat to think about that word exodus there and Jesus Christ leading the exodus from our world? Also notice that Peter's careless talk was shut down again when Christ was revealed to them. For us too, how much of our foolish talk will be shut down when we counter Christ as he really is? Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we need to talk less and have more reverence, less noise, more holy contemplation. It would have been wise for Peter to sit in silence. The prophet Habakkuk, around 2,600 years ago, in uh, Habakkuk 2.20, said, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And when we see and know Christ as he really is, you know what that's called? That's called winning. That's called winning the cosmic lottery. That's the jackpot. I, I now have God as my friend. My sin is forgiven. I'm forgiven. He accepts me just as I am. He knows I mess up. He knows all my dark sides. He loves me anyways. And he's brought me into his family and says, you're a child of the king. You're a daughter of the king. He brings you into his family, and, and all the wealth and riches of God belong to us. We have eternal life. We're going to be with him in paradise. That's called winning, winning the cosmic lottery. Pastor J. Vernon McGee wrote, Good old Simon Peter just has to say something. He should have kept his mouth shut, closed at this time, but he has to speak up, and I guess he thinks he is saying something important. But Luke adds, not knowing what he said. Many people, like Peter, speak pious words without knowing what they say. Peter suggests they build three tabernacles, which puts Moses and Elijah on par with Jesus Christ, although he puts the Lord at the head of the list. Many anthologies of religion will say Buddha, Muhammad, Moses, and Christ as founders of great religion. It may, not seem strange to, it may seem strange to you, but Jesus Christ is not the founder of any religion. He did not found a religion. He died on the cross for the sins of the world. He is the Savior. That is why we are not saved by religion. We are saved by Christ. I remember Dr. Carroll said many times, when I came to Christ, I lost my religion. A great many people need to lose their religion and find Christ. All the ceremonies, all the pious words, all the going through the hoops, all the I'm, I go to church, therefore I'm Mr. Wonderful, all that needs to be thrown in the garbage can and we need to fall before the feet of Jesus Christ and say, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. Lord, thank you for that cross where you paid for my sins. A parallel account of the transfiguration is found in Matthew 17, 1 through 8, and I really like how it's worded. After six days, see, see that? After six days, not about, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. So 
He says, like the sun, like light. Luke says it was like lightning is bright. Uh, just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. They had no strength. Their legs became like jelly. They just fell down, utter, uh, totally, total in, in utter fear. Uh, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came to them, and he gives another little extra detail here. He touched them. Jesus put his hand on them because he knows how hard things can be for us. And he said, get up, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except for Jesus. Brothers and sisters, life can be terrifying. Life can be very difficult. We can be very confused at times. We can say foolish things. But Jesus Christ is a God who puts his hand on our shoulder and says, here's what I want you to do. Get up. Quit moping. Quit wallowing. I knew you were a sinner already. <laughs> quit, quit rolling around in, in, in guilt. Get up. And when we hear the voice of Jesus and we know who Jesus is because we believe the words of God and, and we've encountered him in our own lives, when we get up, all we will see is not our guilt, not our fear, not our concerns, not our worries. All we will see is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ glorified in our lives. And what a good place to be. I don't want to fear all the things that make me afraid. I don't want to live worried about all the things that make me worry. I don't want to be angry about all the petty things that can make me angry. I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus so much that the rest of this world is filtered through him. That when I see people, I love them because Jesus loves them. I don't want religion that's going to build me up so I can look down on other people. I've got a religion where I meet Jesus Christ on my knees with everybody else who wants to come to Jesus on our knees because he is God. and He's God in flesh who loves us, loved us so much he suffered for you and he suffered for me. And when he says, follow me, I'm going to say, okay, where else could I go? I will follow because there's no other place I'd rather be, even if you lead me to some difficult places. I think that for all of us, there's been times when we're like Peter, James, and John. We don't really see Christ clearly. We don't revere him as Lord in our lives. Like Peter, we can say some pretty stupid things at times, right? You didn't need to confess that, but I'm confessing it. You know what? Actually, that's not important. All the stupid things I've said, not important. I'm sorry for them, but they're not important. What matters is that when we finally do see Jesus, when we finally do see Jesus, when we finally get it, what are you going to do now? That matters. Do we pretend like, uh, I'm going to go away from church and just forget this. Do we pretend like nothing's changed? Do we ignore God? Do we look for a reason to forget what we saw and try to avoid thinking about the ramifications of a real God who really loves you and calls you to follow Him? What are you going to do with that call? Or do we finally open our eyes, answer His call, and look up? Because if we do, we will see Christ. And when we see Christ, everything changes. It's never the same again. It's like winning the cosmic lottery. It's better than gaining the whole world, Christ says. We don't miss out. Life is not pointless. Everything isn't hopeless. We win. We get the happy ending. Amen? Amen. Because God loves us. He forgives us. And we won't reject anyone around us that wants to come to Jesus because he's not going to reject anyone who wants to come to him. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, I want to say a simple prayer now and Brothers and sisters, please pray with me in your hearts. Dear God, here I am. I see you better today. Help me not to forget what I see. I want to know Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow him wherever he goes. God, please teach me to deny my selfishness and say yes to you. Father, if there are difficult things in my life, help me to carry that cross. Even, Lord, if some people are going to laugh at me or look down at me or think I'm an idiot 
for following Jesus, Lord. I pray that I'll carry that cross without shame. Lord, help me not to be ashamed of the words of Christ. Help me not to be ashamed of Christ himself, but to live for him wherever I go. God, help me to expand the borders of your kingdom, to bring more people into your kingdom. And Lord, help me to live for you as you have died for me. Help me to love others as you love me. And help me forgive other people as you have forgiven me. God, I want to say thank you for church this morning and thank you that we get to eat together now with brats and hot dogs and hamburgers. And Lord, I just pray we have a wonderful time together. Please, please help us to be grateful for all the blessings you've given us. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.